Okay, we're in midbrain now. We've left ponds behind. How do we know that? Well, we know it because we have an aqueduct. We now have a proper aqueduct. So the best way, the easiest way to figure out where you are in a cross section is to figure out what part of the ventricle system, ventricular system is present. Here we have an aqueduct. The area around the aqueduct is called the periaqueductal gray. It's uh, parenthetically, and really who cares, but um, it is where I spent uh, the better part of the, the 90s and, and, and 2000s in my research career. Um, that aside, <laughs> Uh, what do we have here? We have the, the leftovers of the pontine nucleus. And so you can see here that there, there are axons that were traveling through the uh, base of the ponds that are now present in, these, in this area here, which is called the cerebral peduncles. This is a little bit left over from, um, uh, from the ponds, but here is here are the cerebral peduncles. These are at the base of the midbrain, and they carry axons that are coming down from the cerebral cortex. Um, the middle part of this is what contains the corticobulbar and corticospinal uh, tract fibers. OK, so corticospinal corticobulbar is here. Where is the, uh, the um, you can see Right here is spinal thalamic tract, and right here is medial lemniscus. If, if we go back, remember that medial lemniscus was here, spinal thalamic tract was here, and I told you that this was the lateral lemniscus that was going to become the inferior colliculus. Well, here's the lateral lemniscus becoming the, fir the mo more caudal pair of hills in the midbrain, which is the inferior colliculi. So here's the inferior colliculus right next to it, the spinal thalamic tract, and just medial to that medial lemniscus. These are carrying pain and temperature from the opposite side, light touch vibration proprioception from the opposite side. Corticospinal tract, as you know, I know you know this, is carrying voluntary uh, motor commands to the opposite side of the body. What else do we have? Well, this, remember that I said back here that this is the superior cerebellar peduncle, and it's coming in and doing this as it goes forward. It's doing this, and what we're about to see is where it crosses. So as you go forward, here it is. It's come in, it's crossing, and it's going to off, go off to the contralateral thalamus. This is output from the cerebellum off to the contralateral thalamus. So let's just imagine for a moment that we had a big lesion right here. If you lesion the peduncles or the, or the continuation of the peduncles, what is the difference between lesioning the peduncles and lesioning the cerebellum? Well, there is none, because the, the only way to get in and out of the uh, cerebellum is through the peduncles. So if you lesion this area, what would you get? Would you get an ipsilateral? Would you get a right-sided ataxia, a left-sided ataxia, or a bilateral ataxia? Think, think bilateral ataxia. This is the outflow from both sides of the cerebellum. You lesion here, you get a bilateral ataxia. It is the place where you can get a bilateral ataxia, and it happens. So this is just, just think about, as you're going through all these structures, that you should always be thinking, what would happen? What would happen if that wasn't working? What would happen if it was interrupted? OK, so bilateral ataxia. Um, then we see the medial longitudinal fasciculus, and it's as though it's, it's a gentle hand holding a, a, an apple in its hand. You see, here's the medial longitudinal fasciculus, and then there's this little white area cupped within the medial longitudinal fasciculus. I find this extremely attractive. Um, and w what this is, is this is medial longitudinal fasciculus, and that's the trochlear nucleus. Now remember that the trochlear nucleus gives rise to the entire trochlear nerve. It is the innervation of the superior oblique, one of the extraocular muscles. So it's not a big muscle, such as the lateral rectus. So it is a small nucleus. Abducens nucleus, which gives rise to uh, innervation of the lateral rectus, that's a big muscle. It's a lot of motor neurons. It's a big nucleus. This is a very small nucleus. OK, it's cute. Um, 
And that is all that we're going to look at on this section. This is, as I said, this is the inferior colliculus. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go further forward and we're going to get to away from the inferior colliculus into the superior colliculus, the level of the superior colliculus. So here we have the level of the superior colliculus. We're pretty far rostral. And what do you see nestled be between the, the midbrain? I mean, I'm sorry. What do you see nestled between the superior colliculi? You see this thing right up here? It's a midline structure. What is it? Think, think, think about looking down on the superior, on the, on the dorsal surface of the brainstem. What would you see nestled between the superior colliculi? Pineal gland. That is the pineal gland. And remember that the pineal gland is very important for circadian rhythms. It releases melatonin. It gets input from the uh, eyes so that the release of melatonin is is in, can be entrained by the light dark cycle. Here's the superior colliculus. This is this area that's involved in uh, orienting movements and primarily orienting movements. The biggest input to the superior colliculus is visual, is optical information, visual information. But it also gets auditory and somatosensory input. Um, but because of this structure, because this structure can be intact even when, say, visual cortex is not intact. One can actually have what's called blind sight. And what that means is, let's say there's a, a, um, a bird zipping across your visual fields. You can follow that bird using the superior colliculus even if you cannot know that you're seeing the, vis the, the bird. Okay, so if the visual cortex is uh, lesion because you've hit your head uh, on the back and it's not working, you will be blind in the sense that you will not know what you're looking at. You will, somebody will say, what is that? You'll say, I don't know, I can't see anything. And in fact, you can't see anything, but you can still follow it. That's called blind sight. And so it's a very, it's a, it's a useful um, story because it shows you how the brain divides up various um, tasks. Uh, so seeing and knowing what you're seeing and following what you're seeing um, are two different tasks. So perception and, and following uh, visual targets are two different tasks. Okay, so let's go back to our, our, our old song and dance, which is where are the, uh, where's the corticospinal tract? Well, it's in the cerebral peduncles, which are very beautifully developed here. So here are the cerebral peduncles. The middle third contains the corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts. Uh, where is the um, medialemniscus and the, and the spinothalamic tract? Well, they're, they're getting very near their target. They're up in here. Um, and we don't need to be too specific about where they are, but they're up in here. What else do we see? Well, we see a very important set of uh, cranial nerve uh, uh, nuclei and the only ones that could be what what could be present here the only ones that could be present here are those associated with the ocular motor nerve here's the ocular motor nerve big clue here are the little rootlets coming out from it and they arise from this nucleus right here which is called the ocular motor nucleus now nestled within the ocular motor nucleus is the Edinger Westfall nucleus the ocular motor nucleus is going to control the Four, four extraocular muscles, medial rectus, superior rectus, inferior oblique, and superior, uh, uh, no, that's not right. Um, inferior rectus, superior rectus, inferior oblique, and medial rectus. Uh, and the levator palpebrae. <clears throat> so that's what the, is going to come out of the ocular motor nucleus. And then out of the Edinger westfall nucleus are the uh, preganglionic parasympathetic fibers that are going to control both um, pupillary size and lens accommodation. So together, this is a large structure. We can call this the ocular motor complex. And uh, lesions here are going to uh, produce problems with moving the eyes and, and also um, uh, pupillary uh, control. So just to give you an, a, a blow up of what this looks like, uh, the, here's the aqueduct, here's the periaqueductal gray, here's the uh, ocular motor nucleus, and nestled within is the Edinger Westfall nucleus, and surrounding both of these is the medial longitudinal fasciculus.
Okay, so oculomotor nucleus, enger westfall, medial longitudinal fasciculus. So that takes care of our three tracts plus the cranial nerve nuclei. Now what we need to do is just to look at a few very important um, places. One is this structure here. You can see a circle starting to form here, and it's, become, it's going to be, become more obvious in the next section. This is the red nucleus. This is what I would call motor cortex junior. This is what animals that are not involved in, in, in are not able to uh, individuate their, their distal musculature, such as we do when we play the piano. Um, they use this uh, red nucleus to, to, for a lot of things, such as locomotion and reaching and grasping. Um, and we do too, to a certain extent. So if, for example, if the motor cortex, if the corticospinal tract is, is lesioned, um, if it's lesioned closer to the motor, motor cortex than to the spinal cord, then you can have a, a situation where a person can still walk. And, and essentially what they're doing is they're walking using their rubrospinal tract. Okay? So we'll look at that more when we talk about motor systems. So red nucleus is an important piece. We talked about the spiroclicus and the pineal gland. And now what you see are two uh, important thalamic nuclei. One, if you look here, here's the, the inferior colliculus, and it, gets, it doesn't disappear. It basically gets shoved to the side. So this is what, where the inferior colliculus is ending up, and this is called the medial geniculate nucleus. I tell you that just so you know where it is, you know the name of it. It's also called the medial geniculate body. Those are synonyms, body nucleus. Um, and this is necessary for the auditory pathway. Again, a lesion here will have no effect, no clinical effect. Um, and over here is a big structure. This is the, the, there's a caudal triad of thalamic nuclei. They're going to be the medial geniculate nucleus, this structure here, which is called the pulvinar, and one more nucleus that we'll see in a minute. What does the pulvinar do? It's very important in vision. It's the connection for, for higher visual processing. You need a pulvinar. One, another thing that the pulvinar might do, um, it, I, I don't know that this uh, is, is uh, completely accepted, but a popular notion is that the pulvinar is responsible for, for keeping the visual image steady as you blink. So until I just said that, whenever you blink, you're not seeing the back of your eyelids. You're seeing a constant visual scene. You don't realize that you've blinked. And what does that is, is the pulvinar. It gets, the, it gets a message that you're going to blink, and it says, OK, we're going to ignore that blink. We're going to just keep that scene that was there before the blink, keep it through the blink, and then you can go to a new scene. OK. Um, this is, by the way, the optic tract. Remember, we saw on the, on the outside that the optic tract wraps around the cerebral peduncle. And we're going to go to one more uh, section here, which is uh, where the, uh, the midbrain um, merges with the, the thalamus. And this is sort of on the thalamic side. What you can see is that the aqueduct has opened up into a slit or is opening up into a slit. The slit is called the third ventricle. So this is the third ventricle. This is periventricular gray. The periventricular gray and the periacrodactyl gray are essentially caudal extensions of the hypothalamus. We still see the cerebral peduncles. Remember that the corticospinal tract and corticobulbar tract travel in the middle third. We see over here the spinothalamic tract and the medial lumniscus carrying all the somatosensory information from the contralateral side. And at this point, it's not only contralateral side of the body, but also contralateral side of the face, OK? Whereas, remember, pre-obex, you would have ipsilateral face traveling uh, there as well as contralateral body. But up here, we're very close to where these tracks are going to end in the thalamus. And so this is all the contralateral somatosensory information is here. So those are our three, uh, our three pathways plus one. Here's the ventricle. 
This is, do you, do you know what this is? Imagine, it's not attached. It attaches farther forward uh, in, the, in the thalamus, at the base of the hypothalamus. These are the mammillary bodies cut in cross-section. We see the red nucleus is well elaborated now. We see the pulvinar. Pulvinar is, uh, is, is Latin for pillow, and it, indeed, this looks like a pillow. Here is that medial geniculate. You look here, the medial geniculate's being covered, and there it is, that's medial geniculate, and just lateral to it is the lateral geniculate. The lateral geniculate, medial geniculate, and pulvinar are the caudal triad of the thalamic nuclei. Lateral geniculate is, is uh, recognizable because it has these striations, it has these layers that you can see here and here, and this is a necessary uh, uh, part of the visual pathway. If you lesion here, you will lose the entire contralateral visual field. That is a contralateral hemianopia. Contralateral, you cannot see. Okay? Cannot see the, ha the half on the uh, contralateral side. So what else do we have here? We have the posterior commissure, and this is notable because it is a structure that is very easily seen on images such as MRI images, and it is used as a fiduciary landmark, the, the posterior commissure and the anterior commissure, and a line between them, the PCAC line, is used to align images between uh, individuals. This is a little bit left over of the superior colliculus. And there's one more structure that was present in the last slide um, and is more elaborated here, and that is this structure right here. This white matter area, just dorsal to, this, uh, to where the um, uh, corticospinal tract and corticobulbar tract travel, this is the substantia nigra. Substantia nigra is very important. It has two parts. It has a pars compacta, and it has a pars reticulata. The pars compacta is the part that uh, are, are cells that contain dopamine and project to the striatum. They are the neurons that degenerate in Parkinson's disease. And what's one of the thing that one of the things that is peculiar about them, and this is just a a, uh, a fresh brain, unstained brain. We've been looking at stained brains where white is is black and and gray matter is white. Um, this is a fresh brain. You see the, uh, the front of the brain is down here. The eyes would be here and here. This is the back of the brain. This is the uh, midbrain. Um, here's the aqueduct. Here are the cerebral peduncles. And this black area is the substantia nigra. It's, in fact, the substantia nigra pars compacta because the neurons that make dopamine also make neuromelanin which makes a black, it's black stuff. It's black neural stuff. So did this person have Parkinson's? And I can tell you this, that this person before they died did not have Parkinson's. And the reason I can tell you that is because you need a basically a 90% or more loss of these neurons before the uh, person becomes symptomatic for Parkinson's. So. You're good, good, good until you fall off a cliff really close to, to having the entire complement of, of uh, substantia nigra cells. And we have now gone through the brainstem. So we're now going to go on to the forebrain. That was, in fact, the brainstem is the, is the hardest part of the, of the nervous system. Um, I, I do know that you're going to have to work at this. You, you probably did not. Um, acquire all the knowledge that, that I um, talked about in the first go-round, uh, but just stay calm, drink tea, and, uh, and uh, go through it a few times, and you'll be fine. <music>